Hello everybody, I would like to welcome Peter Hessler who has learned how, how to use and abuse both BGPD and routing domains on BSD. I'm going to talk about the routing domains and routing tables this time. So everybody, give Peter a hand. So thank you. Um, yes, uh, I am Peter Hessler uh, and uh, I am uh, part of the OpenBSD project. And uh, so this talk was uh, not originally on the schedule, so I had to throw it together since last night. So please forgive me if I'm a bit rusty on some of these things. Um, so we'll just start off. And uh, so there's always a question of what is an R table and what is an R domain? So a uh, writing table was uh, the first thing that we added, and this was support for uh, an alternate routing table that would be used. Uh, this could be just simp simply an overlay on top of what was already in the system. Um, you could not have conflicting IP addresses in this. It was only for, for routes to different places over different links. Um, primarily, this would be used for like a policy-based routing system where you want to have all of your IP telephones come in on one interface and always use a specific interface that was low latency but slow, whereas you want your uh, web traffic to go over a different interface that would be faster but possibly high latency. Um, after we added uh, writing domain support, then uh, you can have multiple writing tables belonging in a single R domain. Uh, then so what is an R domain? R domain is it's a completely independent routing instance, and this is uh, it's a virtualized router essentially in your machine. Um, you can have conflicting IP addresses. Uh, you can do several hundred uh, if you if you want to. Um, an interface, however, can only be assigned to one routing domain at a time. Uh, this is uh, also part of how you know when a packet comes into the system, which routing domain does it belong to? Um, routing domains always contain at least one routing table. Um, and, and this is this the normal routing table in, in, your, uh, in your system. So R domains was first added in OpenBSD 4.9. That was released in uh, late 2009. Uh, originally, it was uh, for IPv4 only. Um, and sadly, there was... Uh, some work, but uh, it was not finished uh, to include IPv6 support, and that was uh, finally finished in time for the 5.5 release of OpenBSD released er uh, earlier this year. Um, so there's, there are related terminology that's commonly used in the networking field for this. There's uh, what's called VRF Lite and VRF. Uh, VRF stands for Virtual Routing Framework. This is very common amongst the Cisco and Juniper terminology. Uh, VRF Lite is multiple routing tables and multiple routing domains. Uh, this is primarily done by hand. Um, it is uh, entirely local to the system that you're running it on. Uh, any system that you connect to would not know and would have no way of knowing if that system is running routing domains or not. Uh, that's primarily where I spent most of my time with the VRF framework, is, doing, is implementing VRF Lite. Uh, and then you have VRF, which is uh, also commonly known as MPLS. Uh, this is a technique that uses BGP and uh, LPD. Uh, most commonly large networks are doing this. So for example, you can imagine that a nationwide uh, cable television and internet provider would use this to connect up all of their routers over uh, least links between sites. This would give you um, more routing choices, or uh, simpler routing choices for a, for a lot of those, those links. Um, so there's a couple things that you need to be aware of when you want to use routing domains in OpenBSD. Um, you need to have a valid route. Um, I would say that, so my recommendation is having a default route in the, in the routing domain, even if the routing domain is only used to receive traffic from. In the OpenBC network stack, 
we check the packets when they arrive for a variety of things. Is the checksum valid? Is it an actually valid IPv IP packet, etc.? And one of the checks that we do is we check, do we have a route to send this packet to? to his, can we send it to its destination? And we check this extremely early. We check it before PF, so you cannot use PF to steal the packet and move it to another routing domain. Um, at a previous job, I was professionally supporting this um, with the Ventronic systems, and I would say about 80 to 90 percent of my support calls for routing domains was a missing default route. So that should probably be one of the first things that you do on this. Uh, otherwise, the packet arrives and you have no idea where it goes. Um, debugging can be painful because it is a different routing domain. It may not always be where you think it is. You ha when you run uh, like route commands or other interface commands, they, they by default operate on routing domain zero. They can also operate on the, um, the, the routing domain can also be applied to processes, which I will show uh, later on. So it's how do you know which routing domain that you're in? You need to explicitly remember this. And when you look at, when you, when you build a mental image of the routing table, you need to know which writing table it actually belongs to, so you know where, where it goes. Um, sometimes you want to keep the writing tables completely separate, and the writing domains completely separate from each other, and just do normal routing through that. Uh, that is the default use case, and that works just perfectly fine through OpenBSD. Uh, but occasionally you want to steal some traffic from one routing domain and send it to another one. Um, in that case, you would need to use a classifying engine, and we use uh, the PF framework to classify and to move the packets between the different routing domains. Um, so I will give a very simple uh, setup here so you can see just how it is used and kind of uh, build up a small network in your mind as I go through the other slides. Um, so probably the, the key is the R domain one will ass assign the, the running domain number one to the interface RE0. Um, you need to do that to create a writing domain. Um, once the writing domain is created, then you can start adding IP addresses and networks and, and routes and things like this. Um, when you add it, when you, when you change the routing domain of a network interface, this will remove all configuration data from it. So ordinarily, uh, when you make changes to an interface, it leaves all the existing uh, IP addresses on it. However, 10.0.0.10, uh, .0 it may have a very important meaning on a different routing domain. And so we've decided that we just flush all the, all the configurations of this interface and flip it over. So uh, it's recommended that you do this first to simplify, uh, simplify your configurations and you don't think that you have things that you don't really. Um, and then we create a local host uh, on LO1. Uh, that's just an arbitrary uh, loopback interface. You can choose whichever number you want. Uh, to make things easier for myself, I tend to use the same number as the uh, routing domain. So it makes it uh, much easier to, to imagine things. And then I add a default route here, pointing to 10.0.0.1 and I add this to the running domain number one. And then because I want to be able to log in uh, with SSH on this, uh, we extended route to have an exec uh, option to execute commands uh, similar in the style of sudo, except this runs it actually in uh, that routing domain. And so this is a, uh, a slightly cleaned up example of what it looks like. So you see here you have the routing domain one has been changed, the rest of it is normal. Same thing here. And then uh, also in netstat, to take a look at your, uh, at your routing table, you add the dash T1 option. And that will show you uh, the, the routing table only for that specific routing domain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you run just regular netstat, it'll show you for the default routing domain which is uh, also known as routing domain zero. 
Um, and here's an example uh, from PF to make decisions and things with routing domains. So this, this anchor block here is any packet that arrives on routing domain number 15 will have this rule set applied. It's a fairly, fairly simple rule set. Uh, default to block, allow ICMP, and uh, we have a web server there apparently. Um, this line here will, similar to this rule, pass in traffic from, uh, that arrives on routing domain number two, and it will re-tag it and send it out on routing domain number four. Uh, and then this line here allows us to do a NAT, uh, a NAT so any traffic coming from 10.0 uh, going outside of the network will be NAT to the egress uh, interface and will be put out on our table 20. Um, so as you can see, you can add uh, quite a few different things with PF. You can uh, use it as a selector and as a, um, as a classifier so you can move the packets. So what are some things that you would, so in a very, very common scenario in, in VRF Lite is that you would have a shared infrastructure. You would have you know, you'd be, for example, an ISP. You'd have a variety of customers connecting into your network directly. And they, like all customers, use 10 slash 8 as their IP address range. And so they would want to come in and not have their traffic conflict with each other. Um, but you have backup servers that all of them use. You have syslog servers that all of them use. You would have, um, you know, whatever services that you're providing to them that all these customers would use. Uh, so you would need to do, um, so, for, so you would use uh, PF configurations to allow these sort of things and to classify based on, on your needs. Um, you can have, uh, and uh, as the, the NAT2 example shows, you can have many, many, many uh, clients of yours go through multiple routing domains and then be sent out another one so they can uh, share the same bandwidth pipe. Um, so for example, this, uh, this NAT2 line was actually used uh, by one of our customers. Um, I've, of course, anonymized it. Uh, but that was used by one of our customers to provide internet services for, I believe, uh, 10 client systems, or 10 client routing domains. And they all came, went out the same IP address. And uh, however, uh, all the traffic was fully separated uh, in the routing domains on the inside of their network. Um, of course, you can put monitoring servers and, and whatever else you would need as shared infrastructure. Um, then you get to the full VRF or MPLS. Uh, it requires two different things. It requires a label distribution protocol and, uh, and BGP to actually distribute the networks. Um, you would use uh, LDPD to distribute to label each of the endpoints so it knows which network it belongs to, and then distribute this across, uh, across the network. And then on top of that, you would have BGP that would distribute the networks uh, aiming at each of the endpoint tunnels. Um, that will be basically all of the full VRF for now, because uh, as I mentioned, I spent most of my time in VRF Lite, and uh, I simply don't remember all those details right, right now. Um, so as we put this into production, we discover a lot of interesting things that happen to us as, as we're going through this. Um, the first one was the route exec. And that was originally just a hack tool for us just to set up things and just get it working really fast without having to add routing domain support to each of the individual daemons <laughs> that we wanted to add, add to it. It turns out to be now the officially recommended way to start multiple services in this. Um, when you have a, a, for example, a web server, and it is listening on, it's listening on, on ports, it's bound normally to the default routing domain, routing domain zero. What if you also want it to listen on routing domain 20? Well, either you can use, um, you can use PF to take the traffic and send it across as necessary, 
or you can start up a completely sec second in instance, possibly different configurations, possibly pointing to a different area uh, with the right exec. Um, this is the primary thing that we use now. There are a few things, basically, uh, network tools, things that set, that set routes, need to know uh, natively about, uh, about which routing domain they are. And there's a limited number of other daemons that need to know this, which I'll get to in a few minutes. <coughs> um, yeah, so adding a, uh, our domain to an interface, uh, as I mentioned, it does erase the IP address configuration. So it's highly recommended that you do this first thing before you start setting up the rest of it. You also get into the question of what if you have uh, you know, your, your 10 gigabit link into your switch and you want to have multiple VLANs on different routing domains connecting over the same link. There's no issue there, uh, provided that the, uh, the child and the parent relationship is actually fairly split, as it is with VLANs. So there's no issues with that. And you can even have native untagged traffic beyond routing domain 5, and then a VLAN sitting on top of that beyond routing domain 20. Uh, and then you run into CARP. Uh, CARP is actually it's mostly a full interface, but there's enough that bleeds over to its parent. And so the CARP and the parent interface for CARP must be in the same routing domain. However, you can do CARP on VLAN on physical, and the CARP and VLAN can be on one routing domain, and then you could have another set, and another set, and another set. There's no issues there. Uh, FTP proxy. Um, we ran into a problem with this. Originally, FTP proxy only allowed you to change one of uh, only the destination routing, routing domain. Turns out that this customer wanted nothing at all to run on the default routing domain. So that added a lot of very, very interesting uh, things that we had to, to add and support, uh, similar to uh, what Ted was talking about in his talk about hostile environments. If you can change something, force it to change and see what breaks. Um, so they wanted to do FTP from and to different routing domains, so we had to add support for this. Um, yeah, so, so the source and, route and destination routing domains do matter uh, for your thing. Uh, NTPD became a very interesting uh, problem for us because, as I mentioned before, normally you would use uh, route exec to run the daemon again. Well, what happens when you run multiple NTP daemons? on your machine. They start fighting each other, and time gets wildly out of sync. Uh, on my testing laptop, I had about five different uh, NTP daemons running. And after 30 minutes of wall time, uh, my clock was about five months ahead. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so you, yeah, that gets very, very ugly. And you don't want to do that on a machine that is either pretending to use time or pretending to serve time. Um, so uh, I added um, uh, quite a bit of configuration options to NTPD that allow you to, for each of the individual listen, server, peer, whatever, uh, to individually select which routing domain that it's using. Um, so, you, so you just run one NTPD and then you set up all your configurations. So you want to listen only on the external on routing domain 20, but you want to have individual services on routing domains 3, 4, 5, and 6. <coughs> And then, uh, as I showed earlier, you have the on our domain option, and that was added after the initial release because we discovered that we just wanted to match on all packets that arrived in on this routing domain. That allowed us to radically simplify a lot of these rules that we were writing for them. Um, so yeah, so best practices when you're running this is you Definitely, definitely want default routes or a full routing view in each routing domain. This will bite you in the ass. It will be very, very painful, and it's a very, very common mistake. As I said, 80 to 90 percent of my of all of our support calls at this company were due to missing routes, and it will confuse the heck out of you. So just do that. Um, Take a look at what tricks are available in pf.conf and see what you can do to simplify your configuration and to allow you to get a, a more accurate view of what you're trying to do. 
um, and definitely spend as much time as you can in the planning stages, uh, both to uh, both to minimize how many writing domains that you actually need to use, and so you have a good, solid understanding of what your network will look like after you have started deploying this. Um, it is complex. A lot of people really want this feature because it is uh, pushed quite heavily by some vendors and by some uh, consultants who think it is a very neat idea, which it is, and they think that your network needs it, which likely does not. If you have control over all of the IP addresses in, in your network, you very likely don't need it. You can do everything else with normal, traditional uh, firewalling and VLANing and, and segmentation. Um, but if you have multiple income, if you have multiple links to third parties, and you don't have control over what IP addresses they use, especially if they're using uh, internal RFC 1918 style addresses, then writing domains could be a good solution for this problem. Um, okay, so uh, wow, I ran faster than I thought. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to give special thanks. Uh, so Henning uh, Brower from OpenBSD Project, he added the initial routing, uh, multiple routing table support to the system. Uh, he actually did that originally not for this feature, but so he can get rid of the route to option in PF. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve all of his problems, so he still has to keep it. Um, Claudio Yecker, who is actually giving a talk right now uh, about iSCSI, uh, he actually wrote uh, pretty much most of the code uh, and explained it all, did all the translations of the Cisco speak to what, to what we call it, and then answered all of my asinine questions as we, were, as we were getting up and going. And he's the one who really beat into my head that we need to have the, all the proper routes. Um, and I definitely need to thank Reich Floter, uh, who actually did a lot of the work on integrating this into OpenBSD, did a lot of the testing with us as well. He also funded this uh, with the company that he owned at the time. Uh, so, any, qu any questions? <laughs> no questions? Everyone understands? Nobody understands. Excellent. <laughs> um, I, I have two... I have two, of two, I'm of two minds with routing domains. It is really cool and that we needed to, to add support to, for IPv6, which I finished up uh, at a recent hackathon uh, probably about a year ago, and uh, because we need to make it full-featured. Full On the other hand, for most networks that people have, this is overkill. You don't need it. It's very similar to like running uh, a full BGP installation for your house. <laughs> you don't have a dynamic routing at that? for you. <laughs> <laughs> OSPF is one thing; B full BGP at your house is another. Um, most people simply don't have the, the, that type of networking at their location, so it does. So it do the technology doesn't make a lot of sense to be used. But when it, but when you do need this sort of thing, then we want to make it as powerful as possible and as useful as possible for you. Sorry, we have a quick question. <laughs> Stop clapping. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's possible to see all rules for different domains? Uh, it's possible to see all, all our rules for different domains in, in one command, not to check everyone? No. Okay. You, would ha you would have to enumerate each of, each of them separately, yes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, but when you do run uh, the if config command, that will tell you all of the interfaces that have a routing domain attached to them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. First, uh, so you essentially have the default, I mean, the normal writing table, which is for everything normally, and then you create the traffic domain, which are completely isolate the traffic, correct? Basically, yeah. So, so the when you start the machine and you get your nor and you start the networking mm -hmm. layer, you get 
uh, a routing domain for yourself, and by default, it's routing domain number zero. And within, the, so that is, that's the default that it starts up with. If you do nothing, then nothing changes, and everything behaves as you would normally expect. When you start adding new, uh, new routing domains, what happens is that that interface gets removed from the default routing domain and gets placed into its own separate one. And so uh, the traffic cannot cross over unless you use a technique like PF or you can um, route, exec. route exec or you can even do a loop back uh, from, you know, from your machine out to the switch and then back in on a different routing domain if you want. <laughs> well, Which, <laughs> it makes sense sometimes. Like you have to do that sort of thing uh, on occasion. Yeah. Which I don't know how they maintain that. No idea. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with it. I haven't used it myself. But uh, it's probably very similar to, to what Cisco calls VR Flight. They were the ones who, who wrote all the standards for this and wrote all the, document, all the original documentation. So uh, most people try and, and behave in similar ways to what Cisco did. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Citrix called that traffic domain. Yeah. It's I, I am guessing so, yes. I don't know, but what yeah. I was surprised is if you look at the BSD version, mm -hmm. it's free BSD version 7 on Cisco, I mean on Cisco, <laughs> on the NetScaler, and I have no idea how they maintain that. Uh, so, the question yeah. actually, so mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, it's okay. is what about the, what those vendors and maybe the other OSs? Can you just give a brief overview if they implement the same thing? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, so most of the hardware, the hardware router vendors uh, do this sort of thing. They call it VRF, and uh, so Cisco certainly does it. Um, uh, Juniper does it. Uh, 3Com does it. I think Alcatel does it, and like all the, the major ones do it. Um, as far as free software do, as far as free software goes, um, FreeBSD has it. I don't remember what it's called. I th I think so. Hmm. It's related to, to fibs. It's mul multiple kernel fibs is important. Um, and that is what we call a, a routing table, an, an R table, is, is a different fib. Uh, it, and it's, it's part of it. I just don't remember the name. Um, it's, it's not very well known. <laughs> and uh, Linux certainly has it, but yeah, I just don't remember what it is because I avoid using networking on, on Linux whenever possible. A question there on the, yeah. the side? One more? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Actually, any questions? Um, yeah, just a good clarification on the thing um, at a traffic exchange between routing domains. Um, you said the only way to do this is using PF, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, did you choose to use PF um, uh, to have um, a stateful routing? Uh, while PF gives us stateful routing and that makes things a lot easier, the main reason is because we did not want to create a, a separate classification engine. Uh, PF already knows all of this and PF would already have to deal with uh, uh, moving packets via, through an, a routing domain even if it never changed routing domains. And so it, did not, it did not, does not make sense to us to add yet another thing. Because, um, like, for example, we moved all of the alt Q classification into PF, and we moved the we we moved away from the separate NAT table into into PF, and so we're using PF to tag the packets and to uh, make those decisions for us. Okay, I understand. Uh, because um, I had um, I had a simple setup, um, um, similar setup mm -hmm. some time ago with Junos. Yep. Um, and they call it routing instances, but mm -hmm. um, they break it badly because they don't have that um, set for routing. Uh, so in the Juno's case, you have to create uh, routes back and forth between the R domains, which makes them practically unusable. Yeah, e exactly. And then th we wanted to definitely simplify our lives. And we, and we figured that since s PF knows so much about the network, then we just do it in there. Okay. Makes totally sense for me. OK. Uh, other questions?
All right. Thank you.